What links Lucian, Hooligans and the Olympics? Good news, you're about to find out. I'm Angus Stewart and you're listening to the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. So in this episode, our book is Please Don't Call Me Human by Wang Shuo. Um, its Chinese name is Qian Wan Bia Ba Wo Dang Ren. Um, so that's a title that's still phrased as a request, like the English one, but it doesn't have the word please. I think the word please might just be there to indicate it is a request. Um, so it's literal, the literal meaning of its Chinese name, it's just about the same as the English. Uh, it would probably be something more like don't treat me as a person than don't call me human, if that makes sense. But I think it's still a pretty good um, conversion into English, even if the English one perhaps I don't know, but perhaps sounds a little bit more emotional. So the edition I'm reading is probably the one that most um, British people who would go looking for the book would find. It's the No Exit Press 2005 edition that was released as part of their 18 classic crime and noir books. So it was like, I think it was the company's 10th or 15th anniversary. So they they released it as part of the set. Uh, So the books originally uh, from 1989, when it was published in Chinese, but English editions uh, by various different publishers, probably depending what side of the Atlantic they were on, uh, didn't appear until the year 2000. So in that No Exit Press set, this one's number 14 of 18, and I had a little... With, in, in the inside cover illustration, it's got pictures of all the covers of this set of 18, and I noticed pretty quickly upon opening it that... Wang Shuo is the only East Asian author in that set. I think the only other author with that Asian name is a Turkish person. I'm pretty sure they're Turkish anyway. But yeah, just something I thought was interesting. So the translation of this edition is by Howard Goldblatt. More on him later. Interesting, uh, definitely an interesting guy in relation to this book. The cover image, if if you go searching online, I'm sure you'll find it. It's a human face covered up by a red star. So definitely uh, a little bit of a loaded image there. Um, But if you think the book is going to be just a a trail of misery about human rights in China, it's certainly not that simple. Um, Yes, so taking a look at the back of the book, there are some interesting quotes here. Um, So Stephen King, when he was reviewing or describing a previous novel by Wang Shuo, said that he was perhaps it was the the novel playing for frills was perhaps the most brilliantly entertaining hard-boiled novel of the 90s raymond chandler crossed with bruce lee now i love stephen king but bruce lee what bruce lee wasn't a hard-boiled detective he was a kung fu actor from hong kong So I wonder if this is just the first Chinese name that popped into Stephen King's head or whether Stephen, uh, whether Bruce Lee emanates some kind of cool that Stephen King feels Wang Shuo has. Anyway, not, not the best. I'm, I'm not, not the kind of guy that likes to pick things apart as quote unquote problematic, but I'm just a little bit unimpressed there. Anyway, there's another kind of uh, Western reference point on the front and the back cover. It quotes the New York Times as saying Wang Shuo is China's Kerouac. Uh, I mean, maybe, but I still don't like the New York Times. Go away. Had enough of you. So another thing about the back cover, uh, on the back it says crime fiction. So I'm guessing this book, which is not about crime, really, about dodgy dealings, yes, certainly not. It's about official dodgy dealings, not criminal ones. So I think it's got, it's ended up in crime because it, because of its hard-boiled or noir connotations, which are maybe more from Wang Shuo than the book itself, and I reckon their hard-boiled fell under the wider category of crime, but it's really not a crime fiction book, so that's interesting too. Uh, also, on this back blurb, it just... It just goes ahead and spoils the ending. I'm going to spoil the plot on this podcast, but that's that's different. But yeah, um, without giving away the sentence just yet, it, the, the back bar, but it, it tells you like the final scene of the book. Um, there's a Guardian reviewer. He's called Nicholas Lazard. If you Google this book, at least on UK Google, that's one of the first pages that shows up. And Nicholas Lazard took some issues with the uh, 
Goldblatt, the translator, and he also took issues with this blurb. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more later into the podcast. But yeah, I find it quite amusing. So this translator, Howard Goldblatt, um, he's done quite a lot of other big books and big uh, authors translated from Chinese to English. It's probably his biggest name is Mo Yan, who's a, I believe he's a laureate winning, or at least a highly awarded Chinese author who's never actually been banned by the government. Although perhaps if he was less prestigious, he might have been. Uh, so Howard Goldblatt's done him, and he's done more... Well, writers of the past, like Lao Shu, and yeah, so Goldblatt, whatever you, whatever this Guardian reviewer thinks of his uh, quality of this particular translation, the guy's had a successful career. Uh, Goldblatt also wrote the introduction, uh, the translator's note for Please Don't Call Me Human, um, so there's a few interesting things in it. Near the end, he credits Sylvia Lin, obviously Lin, Chinese lady, um, for helping him out with the translation, and if you check out Howard Goldblatt's Wikipedia page entry, Sylvia Lin is his Lin is his spouse. So I don't know if if that was the case during uh, the time of the translation of Please Don't Call Me Human, but it just it it does make you wonder um, how much of the share of the work she has. You know, you can have these situations where a sp- a, a spouse, often the wife, is kind of a power or a, a worker behind the throne and she would be a Chinese native speaker. So without trying to sound too cynical, I do think that's interesting. Uh, Goldblatt's introduction does do, it does make quite a good move straight off the bat. It introduces uh, the concept of face as in like saving face, which every culture has. Uh, Chinese culture is very much into it on the and the level of individuals, of groups, of institutions, but also for the country. One of the themes that Goldblatt's correctly identified in Please Don't Call Me Human is kind of saving face or building up face for the nation. Um, we'll get a wee bit more into that, I think, as we get when we get to the part of the show where I describe the plot. Uh, another thing that Howard Goldblatt does in his pretty quick translator's introduction is that he justifies the choice he made not to explain every single reference to kind of Chinese culture and society and history and also not to swap them out for Western equivalents. Um, He thinks that would destroy the authenticity of the book, basically. Uh, Howard Lazard, his Guardian critic, said it's basically lazy and it turns a lot of the book into kind of a in China, in-crowd book. Um, I I have sympathy for both arguments. I mean, obviously, when the book was written in Chinese, there's no problem with these references. And whether or not you think all the references should be explained to Western audiences, it's it's going to depend on who you are, whether you have access to some of these in-jokes. I I didn't get all of them. I got a lot of them. Uh, Yeah, so I've meandered a bit there. Suffice to say, I liked the kind of very recognizably Chinese twisty dialogue. It's also part of Wang Shuo's style, but um, I feel that when you translate Chinese into English and you don't, you you try to keep some of the original feel and meaning, it feels different from reading just straight English dialogue, and it's a thing I enjoy, uh, and I enjoyed all the references too, although I also kind of enjoyed not quite getting everything, because that's how you feel when you're living in another uh, country or culture. So yeah, a little bit of confusion. Not knowing what's going on, that's life anyway, isn't it? There is also an error in this introduction. So right in the first page, um, Howard Goldblatt says the book uh, is kind of kicking off the 1993 awarding of the Olympics to Sydney and not Beijing, and how this was a great loss of face for the Chinese nation. Uh, Howard Goldblatt obviously didn't look at when this book was first published, 1989. So unless Wang Shuo teleported himself into the future, to 1993, there's no way he could have been reacting to Beijing being passed up for the year 2000 Olympics. I don't know. Um, That could also indicate something about the way Goldblatt did this translation. Maybe a little too quickly, perhaps. Um, The the theme of the, the Olympics and how it wins or loses face for a nation is 
that is pertinent to the novel. But um, yeah, Goldblatt should have done, or his publisher should have done a you know this very small amount of fact checking to avoid the error. But honestly, on my first reading, I didn't spot that. I only spotted this error in um, research for the podcast, and definitely like finding finding proper evidence of the original publication date of this book on the English language internet, like. Yeah, it's not easy, um, and a lot a lot of uh, websites will just list its publication date as the publication of the first English translation, and sometimes even not the first English translation. So, just goes to show, just a surface level a surface level Google search isn't always your friend. Sometimes you've got to sniff around, but I'm sure you already knew that. So, who is Wang Shuo? That's a good question. Here I am to answer it. So first of all, let's uh, talk about this guy's youth. So he was born in 58, and he was jailed twice in the 70s. So this would be during China's Cultural Revolution. Wild, kind of lawless, formative years. Um, To paraphrase somebody, I forget who, basically, nobody was above the law in this time except Mao. Absolutely anybody could be shot down and on the streets the red guards youth kids teenagers they were the bosses and they could you know bully people into suicide um send people off to jail get them beaten up and yeah so although this was like technically a highly communist ideological repressive time it was also a bit anarchic and for just a wild kid like wang shuo you know could have been a fun time to mess about. So anyway, he was jailed once for a gang fight, and the second time he was jailed, he'd grabbed a policeman's hat at Tiananmen Square as it was being cleared out. There'd probably been some kind of a a Maoist rally. Um, Tiananmen Square's historically been your place for both positive political rallies and protests. So don't ever go thinking... The only time people gathered gathered there was 1989, because certainly not. Um, so, after this kind of wild youth, um, Wang Shuo's father, who was generally pretty sick of him, sent him off to the People's Liberation Army Navy in Qingdao, which is a kind of a north, fairly northeastern port that uh, China historically used um, to keep a fleet ready for defense against the Soviet Union. Um, so Wang Shuo was there, he was never called up to service, and he had no ambitions to kind of climb the career ladder or within the Navy or within the party. So he just lounged about on the beach and he womanized, apparently, but never enough to get into trouble, which was basically, it afforded him all the freedom he wanted. Um, in 1978, he got one of his stories published in the People's Liberation Army Literature and Art Journal. You know, one upside of communism, do you think that the UK Army has a literary journal? Perhaps not. Maybe maybe a more bloated army like the US one does. Anyway, I'm waffling. Um, so the, the, the people who ran this journal were so impressed by Wang Shuo's story that they, they gave him a wee editorial spot. Um, he Wikipedia tells us, or was, it, or was it the article I read? Anyway, he... He didn't have much of an effect there, but he did reject a couple of prominent authors, which does sound right in character for him. Yep, so after, after that spot in Qingdao, he ended up with the Navy on the south coast, and some of his he and some of his Navy pals ran a smuggling operation. It's just ridiculous. Um, after his smuggling operation, he kind of sleezed and laced about with a pharmaceutical company. He, I, ah, yeah, just a sleazy guy, um, but... He went kind of straight in the 80s and got published, I think, it, yeah, his novels got published regularly and he was successful enough. There was quite a lot of film adaptations of his novels and he also, I don't, I think it might have been in the 90s, but he also has some, had some spots on a talk show on Chinese TV and if you go on YouTube, there's bits of it up there. Um, they're untranslated though, so I, I didn't watch them because my Chinese just is not good enough to be able to get anything out of those really. So just to give you a flavour of Wang Chuo from his own mouth, I'm going to read you a wee excerpt from a 1989 interview that a older member of China's literati did with him. So this older guy I think was quite impressed with Wang Chuo because according to 
my research um the style of this interview was like very mischievous lots of wordplay lots of kind of tongue-in-cheek humor so anyway here's wang shuo on wang shuo i know just what i'm capable of if you think i should be doing something for others serving the people or whatnot well quite frankly i reckon about the only thing i could manage in that department is to polish their shoes i've got no other talents I've reached this age, and apart from my mouth, which has been over-exercised, everything else has been underdeveloped. I can't just go out and lie to people, can I? Anyway, I've tried, and it doesn't work. It's no fun either. You need to know just as much as you do to write fiction, and it doesn't have the same status. Anyway, writing isn't entirely the same as prostitution. Something you can get away with, if you're shameless enough. Even now, I wouldn't say I'm a master of the technique of writing fiction. Bugger if I know all the ins and outs of it. And you wouldn't want me to natter on about intellectual content, philosophy, the grand sweep. Well, give me a break. Yeah, so as you can see, a guy with no time for pretentiousness. Unless, of course, this whole thing is a character he's created, which would be pretentious. But I'm, I'm pretty sure he's genuine. Also, the, the way he's speaking here in this interview, although bear in mind, is... It is a writ. It was, it was published as writing, not as spoken word. So it might be tailored a bit. But anyway, this mode of speech is pretty similar to how um, how Wang Shuo's characters speak. So yeah, an another wee fact, maybe about his lifestyle that is is interesting, is well, it's it starts with the fact that in China you can be a state funded writer. Perhaps one of the upsides of of a socialist system that's got money to spend on things like this. So in China, if the government thinks your literature is worth putting out there for either, you know, cultural or ideological reasons, um, you can get a salary and you can get reg regular publication. So it's, it's not straight propaganda. They will publish people who are just good writers, but they certainly wouldn't pay this wage or publish, you know, people who say things they actively don't like. Um, but yeah, Wang Shuo has never been a state funded writer. Um, he's never actually needed to because he's, well, in his time of writing, he was always successful enough to just live a life of live a life of leisure, live as a liomang. But what's a liomang? So, for this podcast, I read an essay on so-called liomang culture or liomang wenshui. But um, what is a liomang? Well, basically, the word means hooligan, um, but it's it has a has a broader kind of cultural meaning within China, especially. After the end of the Cultural Revolution, when the uh, after the death of Mao, when the country began to open up in the 90s, what you might call like a slacker culture or some kind of counterculture started to emerge, and it was certainly like a mostly a male kind of basically the Wang Shuas of the world felt quite free and were able to exercise their freedom in this kind of new, strange, dislocated China. So, one of the first scholars who at least Western scholars, um, who suggested that this Liu Mang thing might have some broader significance was John Minford. He was writing in 1985. So bearing in mind this is a Westerner looking at China, here's what he said. On this post-Mao wasteland, a strange new indigenous culture is evolving, which could, perhaps a little provocatively, be called the culture of the Liu Mang, an untranslatable term loosely meaning loafer, hoodlum, hobo, bum, punk. The original Liu Mang is to be seen cruising the inner streets, inner city streets on his flying pigeon bicycle, looking somewhat lethargically for the action, reflective sunglasses flashing a sinister warning. Liu Mang in everyday speech is a harsh word. It's the word for antisocial behavior, a category of crime. So I'll just jump in here and say there's another famous Wang Shuo, well, at least in the Western world, a, Wang, a famous Wang Shuo book, playing for thrills, and the edition I have um, has got a picture of a guy wearing sunglasses on the cover, and from what I've gathered, I've not read my copy of this book yet, but playing for thrills is much more of a textbook, Leo Mang book, than um, please don't call me human is. We'll get to we'll get to that later, but yeah, it's um, certainly an interesting way of looking at how Wang Shuo has been understood, um, especially in the Western world, in the way he's kind of marketed and presented and the fact that a, a company like no exit that kind of publishes a lot of liter slightly literary pulp picked him up definitely an interesting thing to consider so this 
idea of Liu Mang being a cultural or psychological thing as well as just a hooligan. This wasn't a new idea in the teas. Chinese literati had talked about it before. So I mentioned Lu Xun at the start of this show, and here's something Lu Xun's brother, Zhou Zuo Ren, remember Lu Xun was a pen name, he was really from the, the Zhou family. So here's something Zhou Zuo Ren, his brother, said in a famous essay. He said, Two demons live within me. One is a gentleman, the other a Liu Mang. I love the attitude of the gentleman and the spirit of the Liu Mang. And I was able to glean that the word he was using for demon was Gui. So two demons, Liang Ge Gui. Uh, Gui can mean ghost. It can also mean demon. It does have this kind of malicious, uh, sometimes perverse or wicked connotation. So yeah, there's, there's the Lucian link the way episode one of the show links up with episode two. If you follow Chinese news, you'll know about the death of Liu Xiaobo. I think that was last year. So if, if, if you're not familiar with Liu Xiaobo, he was a literary critic who said things the Chinese government didn't like. I believe he wrote about human rights. Uh, so he's been in the news in the last few years because of his uh, decline and the way the Chinese government handled it, letting him kind of basically die of cancer in custody. Um, pretty sad stuff. But back in the previous decades, Liu Xiao, Xiaobo, um, well, for, for, of course, his whole lifetime, he was writing interesting stuff. But, um, back in the time of the Liu Mang, he had a, he weighed in on the question of this kind of slacker culture that had emerged in, in, in literature and life. So here's what Liu Xiaobo had to say about Liu Mang. He said, who are these protagonists? Are they models of decadence and cynicism? Are they descendants of the superfluous people and derelicts that appear so often in Chinese and Western 19th and 20th century literature? Are they a contemporary Chinese mutant form of the absurdists, dadaists, black humorists and beat generation of modern and contemporary Western culture? It would seem that they contain elements of all. Um, so the essay I'm getting all these quotes from also mentions that critics had drawn connections between these Liu Mang and the kind of wandering knights of older imperial Chinese fiction and storytelling. I'm not going to dive into that, but it is it is an interesting thing that there are kind of individualistic heroes um, and kind of bad boys and bad girls in historic Chinese culture and popular fiction. Although, you know, the, the stereotype of China is that stories are more collective. Um, these kind of offbeat outsiders, they are part of the literary tradition. So just throwing that out there for you. So it's probably about time I should explain the plot of this book. I'll, I'll just give you like the basic premise and then kind of the three main plots or character arcs, if you like, that make up the story. So the basic premise is that a committee, a government committee is formed and they try to give themselves a cool new name to inspire people to feel great about Chinese sporting and sporting athletes and achievements. So in the English translation, the name they came up with is the Mobilization Committee or MobCom, MobCon for short. It's pretty, pretty nice work there by the translator. And the MobCon, they're, they're looking for a boxer or a fighter because they've heard about a video that's gone the rounds of this basically big blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy, a.k.a. a Westerner, beating up uh, a series of Asian combatants. And it, it's interesting to note, I think, that the mob mobcon kind of conflate all these fighters of an Asian appearance. They're like, oh, this is a great insult to China. Although technically, the book does not tell us those fighters were Chinese. That's probably meant to be looked like an assumption on their part, but who knows? It could have been Wang Shuo also made the same conflation. I may be dipping my toes into water here, I don't quite understand. But yeah, the book doesn't specify these factors are Chinese. It just says Asian, and it just says this big bad guy is... I think it might specify he's French, actually. I think we might get his nationality. In any case, that's not the point. The point is, he's a big Westerner, and he's just humiliated the East. And it's demoralizing, or so MobCon think. So they need to find a way to get a great dream fighter for the Chinese nation for the next, next Olympics. And they do some hunting and they find a descendant of one of the boxers from the Boxer Rebellion. Um, 
which I'll just give a really, 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 really condensed version of, of them. So at the time when Western influences were at their height, at the end of the last imperial Chinese dynasty, there was a rebellion in the north of the country, um, a totally grassroots one, where these Kung Fu fighters mostly rose up um, against the various Western colonial powers and the Japanese, who were pushing the people around, and they got absolutely flattened. But they, they put up enough of a fight for long enough that they kind of have con- gone down in official Chinese history as heroes. So anyway, Mobcon source out one of their descendants, who's this just kind of Liu Mang kind of guy. And that's, so that's probably the first two plots. We follow the members of Mobcon a lot, and they're, they're totally just parodied. The way they speak is like this weird officialese. They kind of speak in the way that the gov- Chinese government and party would do their official statements and press releases. Their logic's incredibly warped. They're bit like they they they're kind of like comedy clowns in a way. Most of them anyway. So that's them, and they they hire this guy or they they recruit this guy Tang Yuan Bao, who starts off as this kind of slacker pedicab driver, but kind of turns away from being a Liu Mang into being kind of just a sponge. He he signs up to their plan to turn him into an amazing fighter and then just becomes incredibly passive, which is kind of the link to this book's title. He he says something like, quite early on, he says, from now on, don't treat me as a human, just kind of treat me as an instrument to, to your goal. So the Tang Yuan Bao plot didn't really thrill me, because, um, yeah, he's not an interesting character, really. At least maybe maybe on a, as an idea, he's interesting. As a person, he starts off interesting and then just becomes... A thing that is acted upon, I suppose. I mean, it, it, it's funny, but it's a very dark humour. Another kind of darkly comic plot. This is like a subplot, really. Mobcon also picks up uh, Tang Yuan Bao's granddad, uh, Tang Guotao. And Tang Guotao was actually one of the boxer rebels. And the Mobcon, looking for a national hero, kind of start to interview him on his involvement with that rebellion. But it, it 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 takes like a really dark, absurdist turn because he's an old guy. His his memories aren't always consistent, and also um, the truth doesn't always match up with what Mobcon want to hear. And gradually, his interrogators get more and more angry that he's not telling them what they want to hear. And it ends up with Tang Guotao being as denounced and responsible for like every every plague on the earth and every plague on the Chinese nation. And that one. That plot's arguably more on the nose, more di- directly political, but um, yeah, it's pretty pretty entertaining to read, and it's interesting to see how Wang Shuo kind of meshes his own surreal version of history with kind of the real history of this of this rebellion. Anyway, that's that. So uh, the, the the plot concludes with Tang Yuan Bao, the the younger guy who used to be the pedicab driver, just submitting to more and more humiliations. There's 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 a part that's not very PC that certainly wouldn't go down well if the book were republished to acclaim in this day and age, um, where the Mobcon realize that they're gonna have an easier time if or there's there's some contorted reason why they think they can benefit if they get Tang Yuan Bao into the women's Olymp. So they they send him to a women's dancing school, they quote unquote feminize him very heavily and then eventually he's he's uh, castrated which sounds like it would be the absurd conclusion but actually the kind of wild conclusion that's revealed on the blurb is that in when when Tang Yuan Bao finally gets to the Olympics all the athletes just start humiliate physically humiliating and degrading themselves as a show of their commitment so it's not just the Chinese who do this but Tang Yuan Bao knocks it out of the park by just ripping his own face off and kind of wins the Olympics. So gives you a sense of how much realism there is in this book. It's um it's supposed to be absolutely ridiculous. So I'd rate this novel four out of five destroyed members of the Tang family. Or eight out of ten Liu Mang. Uh eighty out of a hundred committees. Hmm. Eight hundred out of a thousand ripped off faces. Alright, so to evaluate it a bit more seriously, um I mentioned before, I really like the kind of, I wouldn't call it sassy dialogue, but like very indignant, spiky, uh, sometimes kind of strangely convoluted dialogue. I honestly enjoyed that. Um, it's got some really good one-liners too, but in, in the dialogue and the narration, 
sometimes it's just it it's a very sneaky reference to something sometimes it's just a completely absurd turn of phrase um it this is probably good work by the translator because i i have read that the way wang shuo parodies kind of the official communist speak let's say of the chinese government is pretty genius obviously a lot of that is going to be lost in translation but yeah there's just there's just turns of phrase here in this english translation that brought me joy sparked joy you might say yeah uh, i think it's a brave book as well it, um so granted although we think of 1989 as tiananmen square that happened in a context where the 80s there was ever increasing kind of social liberation and freedom in china so a book like this probably wouldn't get published in today's china um regardless i think it is a pretty brave thing for wang chua to write it's it reads as a really big kind of middle finger to the way his own government uses and abuses nationalism nationalist fervor um history um history that predates their own time in power mind you and even the formation of the party they'll they'll yeah i, I won't i won't dig into that and like i said they're they're officially it's not a book that's super strong on uh its own characters they're mostly just kind of cardboard cutouts comedy characters um the plot the plot feels like it's kind of just moving in the same way tang yuan bao just gradually gets more degraded they get closer to the olympics it's not a super gripping plot but the content is i just said content i'm sorry anyway the contents of this book are enjoyable if it's your thing it's also just a very surreal book um i was considering writing up a list of strange things i did not but I, I do recall there's one scene where they take um they take tang yuan bao to a uh, kind of like a shaman lady and i think the fact that tang yuan bao he's he's technically not ethnically han i think he's from one of the northern quote unquote barbarian ethnicities of china and this gets played on because the um shaman lady she either thinks herself or tang is possessed by the spirit of yu fei who if i recall correctly he's he was a general of the chinese song dynasty which kind of fought a long slowly losing war against northern invaders and it's just a really strange scene this old lady's like threatening to destroy him and tying him up and yeah so that's just one of many strange moments in this book which glancing at its cover you might think it's some gritty exposé on human rights abuses in china really it's not that it's honestly more about face and nationalism and degradation and ab absurdism an awful a, a great big spoon of absurdism right so i've got a couple kind of closing points um one's on freedom and censorship so i've gone looking for evidence online to back up my claim or other people saying the same thing i didn't see any then again i didn't look for very long but i have heard this mentioned by um let's say china hands on podcasts and it is something i felt i noticed myself so it's about what i want to say is about freedom and censorship in chinese literature i.e books versus on the internet film and tv so china is not so different from the western world who watches tv and films everybody who reads books not everybody is there a divide based on your education absolutely is that divide kind of rooted in class yeah of course very often so and also the numbers the numbers of people who read regularly are way below the everybody who goes online and watches films so films that can get made and released in china are pretty hemmed in by what's acceptable i mean it's there are films made about social issues not as many as there would be in the west but you certainly can't go taking shots at the government or if you if if you do like um was done by Feng Xiaogang in the film I'm not Madame Bovary, Wu Busha Pan Lin Jian, it would be at corrupt officials, not at the guys in charge. Because um there is there has been a purge against corrupt officials going on for a while. Anyway, um the Chinese internet is notoriously censored. It's so censored that as has filtered through to the Western world. We we know about the ban on Winnie the Pooh. That's a real thing. Um <laughs> huge numbers of websites are blocked huge numbers of terms are monitored and it's ve it's a very attentive censorship things are can be things can be cut off as soon as they happen 
But in the world of books, you can say and write and publish plenty things that might not be acceptable online. So all, all of this is a little bit irrelevant because um, Please Don't Call Me Human is from 1989, before the internet basically. And in the early years of Chinese internet, it wasn't censored. And even when the censorship began, it was at a level far below what it's at now. But yeah, just just thought I'd say we might be looking at things you wouldn't expect would get published in China in this podcast. But actually, books books are um, a lot more free than other more popular media. Not to say they're free, but just something to bear in mind. Okay, so another thing that will be probably mentioned on other shows um, is about Western tastes. So what books the or what books from China the Western market see are perceived to be willing to buy and how that determines what gets translated um so this is just my two cents feel free to disagree feel free to reply but i think a lot a sin that a lot of westerners commit is thinking that everywhere in the world wants to be like the west iraq look at that libya even if a country wants to be free doesn't think it thinks that the light shines out western countries bombs and I think you can kind of see this in the Chinese fiction we publish, as well as foreign policy. Um, so what I'm trying to say is there's quite a lot of um, Chinese writers who get translated who are edgy or banned or rebels. Wang Shuo is one of those. And there's, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. It's great that these guys are being read outside the country. I just think it is tickling an itch that Westerners seem to think that if a country has a government like China, the people there will be absolutely yearning for freedom with every breath and thought. But anyone who's lived there will know it's just not the case. Um, if you are, if you're in a situation where the government are c- limiting your freedom, but you have a good life, sorry, human nature isn't to fight the good fight. If if you're being provided a nice life, most people won't really have an issue. Go there yourself, check it out. Ask people when they're planning to overthrow their government and you'll be they'll they'll get mad at you. So to illustrate my point a little bit, I'm gonna quote from the essay I've been drawing a lot of my quotes from for this episode. So it was uh, an essay on Wang Shuo and Liu Mang or Hooligan Culture by Jeremy Barn. It was published in the Australian Journal of Chinese Affairs in nineteen ninety two. And here is the quote. So it's regarding another one of Wang Shuo's novels, not Please Don't Call Me Human, uh, a different one. So here, here, here we go. In another scene set in the story's Liu Mang literary salon, there's an obvious reverence, re- reference to the events of early 1989 and an apolitical slash anti-political Liu Mang reflection on political dissent and survival. A dirty young man in jeans appears, probably a decadent poet and masturbator the narrator Fang Yan thinks to himself. This fellow is holding a petition for human rights in China, for which he has come to solicit signatures. The paper, quote, looked like someone had pissed on it and then dried it in a dark, a dank room. It stunk, end of quote. The Liu Mang offers refuse to sign. We've got more than enough human rights, one of them blurts out, anymore, and we won't know what to do with them. Another breaks in with the remark, you're one of that mob who's pushing for total westernization, aren't you? Well, go back and tell your bosses. Forget about trying to forge a path for China. We're not going anywhere. One of the others ends the encounter angrily with the words, Who do you think you are anyway? Just because you dump on the Communist Party, you reckon you're a hero. Let me tell you, things have changed. No matter what happens, your lot's not going to be in charge. The gang of writers send the petitioner off amidst a hail of abuse, remarking to each other, It's really true what they say. When the nation is in crisis, all types of evil creatures come out of the woodwork and all manner of fake dragon emperors stalk the land. So I I have no idea how sincere um, um, Wang Shuo is being here, and I've got no idea how much his ideas match up with these authors who are from the kind of Leo Mang style of writing he writes in. But yeah, honestly, don't, don't go thinking that everyone wants to live like a Westerner lives. It's certainly not the case. So just because Wang Shuo is a rebel doesn't mean... He's your kind of rebel. So just before we get to near the end of this podcast, I'd like to read a wee passage from Please Don't Call Me Human because I think it's really great and it gives you a great flavor for the official ease. Yeah, it gives you a little taste of the official ease that um, 
Wang Shuo uses in this book for the members of MobCon. So this in this part of the story, it's early on and they've just come up with the name for MobCon. So before this, they don't know what they're going to call themselves. So I'll just I'll just kick it right ahead. I've got an idea how we can start it, the corporate manager said. Tell me what you think. The National People's Mobilization Salvation through Loyalty and Virtue, the agricultural entrepreneur volunteered. The National People's Mobilization for Salvation through Loyalty and Virtue. No good, Zhao Hang Yu said somberly after a momentary reflection. National Salvation? Which nation? Salvation from what? Our nation's doing just fine, thank you, and getting better. What you're proposing smacks of scare tactics. Don't ever forget that we're in the entertainment business. The nation's in fine shape, everyone has plenty to eat, and leisure is the logical result. That you've invested in our enterprise proves not only that you've got plenty to eat, but that you're, that you're in the lap of luxury, doesn't it? Then how about move toward the world, a private businessman said. The National Mobilization Committee to move toward the world. That's no better, too vague, the presiding officer said, taking his cue from the look on Zhao Hang Yu's face. If I'm not mistaken, there's already a 21st century committee or something like that. Here's what I think we should do, Zhao Hang Yu said expansively, a broad grin on his face. Since we can't come up with a name that reflects what we're doing, why force the issue? We can call ourselves the, nationalize, the National Mobilization Committee. No one has to know what we're mobilizing for. Keeping it ambiguous has two distinct advantages. First, it makes it hard for outsiders to figure out what we're up to. Second, it opens up all sorts of possibilities, since virtually anything we want will fall under the umbrella. That, in turn, will unify people from all classes and walks of life. Let others try to figure it out, the presiding officer asked with a giggle. Old Jow's got my vote. There you go. I, I, I love it. And with that, I'll draw the show to a close. So, as ever... If I've got anything wrong, if you'd like to disagree, if you'd like to agree, if you'd like to share your thoughts, then you can zap me a message through the social media links I'm going to put in the show description. Um, I'm also going to link to the Leo Man culture essay that I got a lot of my quotes and information from. And I am not going to put a link to this text up online because guess what? It's still in copyright. However, interesting fact, if you search the Chinese name, you'll find lots of Chinese sites that have the book uploaded chapter by chapter. I guess that's a, an interesting difference between uh, the Western book market and the Chinese book market, where in China copyrights just aren't as protected, for better or for worse. Uh, anyway, I'm waffling, so for now, bye-bye. Hayo, 再见, 我的哥们。